Richard Serrett's Strange Planet, following the truth wherever it leads, exposing evil and corruption and the secret machinations of powerful elites, revealing the high strangeness beneath the surface of our supposed reality, coming to you from the Great White North and his studio beneath the stairs. Here's Richard. Welcome to the broadcast. And if talk radio was an Olympic sport, this show would own the podium, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Do you remember that? Own the podium. That was our clarion call here in Canada for the 2010 Winter Olympics. I don't know if that's still the the the, uh, the mantra or the mantra uh, for uh, 2012. So far, we've got a bronze medal, Canada, a bronze medal in synchronized diving. Uh, now, admittedly, I'm not a huge um, uh, fan of the Olympics, but uh, the mighty Aphrodite is uh, basically incommunicado. She is glued to the TV set for the next, is it, what, 17 days? Uh, and, uh, I mean, I have to communicate to her, like, using, like, cinephore or something, because she will not speak, she will not eat, she will not rest for the next 17 days. She's watching the Olympics um, every waking hour, and then even in her sleep. I believe. Uh, but she was uh, glued to the set watching uh, us take uh, a bronze and synchronized diving. And uh, to me, though, the great story of the Olympics is uh, this 14-year-old student. Have you heard about him? Marios Hatsidimu. He won a a, um, a letter writing co- competition. It's called the 41st UPU Letter Writing Competition for Young People. They were asked to send a letter to an athlete or a sports personality they admired it and, and tell them, what the Olympic means, the Olympics means to them. And uh, I've actually tweeted that. If you want to read his letter, absolutely uh, brilliant and just elegant in its simplicity and its innocence. Uh, everything that the Olympics should be, he, he, he really pours into this letter to Roger Federer, who is his idol. And um, the mighty Aphrodite had a brilliant idea. For the closing games, they have, again, the Parade of Nations. And this young man, Marios Hatsidimu, should be carrying the uh, the Greek flag into the Olympic Stadium because what he writes in that letter really embodies what the Olympics are supposed to be about, once what they were once about uh, before uh, a doping and steroids and, and um, scandal, basically. Scandal. Uh, we're going to talk about um, perhaps the biggest scandal in all of history here in the uh, early going of the program. But before we get to that, let me welcome a new affiliate uh, for The Conspiracy Show and a big, big hello to WKAC 1080 in, I believe, Huntsville, Alabama. WKAC 1080 Huntsville, Alabama. Yes, welcome aboard. Good to have Alabama uh, with us. And uh, what is Alabama's uh, state motto? Um, we'll have to look that up, and we'll have that for you before the end of the show. I mean, you know, Pennsylvania is the Keystone State. Uh, Michigan is the Wolverine State. Uh, Tennessee, the Volunteer State. Alabama. David Gaskin, my technical producer, you looked that up. That's your homework assignment. All right, I mentioned the biggest scandal in history. That sounds like hyperbole, you're saying. Well, wait till you listen uh, to this story. Now, we have touched on this uh, very important topic in the past. We didn't give it enough time. We're going to revisit it again tonight. And uh, this has to do with $27.5 trillion. I think I have your attention, right? 27, 27.5 trillion dollars. And a gentleman who holds the financial golden key to that money, this gentleman says he held this money in public trust for the American people. He wants to give it back. Lord knows they could use it right about now. The real problem as it stands today, though, is it remains in limbo because if he tries to return it to the U.S. Treasury, it will be immediately hijacked from the American people, put into the private Illuminati bank account, uh, since under the present Federal Reserve and the national banking system, there are no laws protecting the American people's money. We're going to talk about Ambassador Leo Wanta and the missing $27.5 trillion. 
right here, right now on The Conspiracy Show. Marilyn Magruder Barnwall began her career as a journalist with the Wyoming Eagle in Cheyenne. During her 20-year banking career, she wrote extensively for the American Banker, Banking or Bank Marketing Magazine, Trust Marketing Magazine, and other major industry publications. The American Bankers Association published a Barnwall's Profitable Private Banking, The Complete Blueprint, in 1987. She taught private banking at Colorado University for the ABA and trained private bankers in Singapore. And she is the author of When the Swan's Neck Breaks. Marilyn Magruder Barnwall, welcome to The Conspiracy Show once again. How are you? Well, I'm terrific. I just watched Missy Jackson win the uh, the 100-yard backstroke. Wow. In her, in her category. I'm with, I'm with the, the goddess or the, the, the mighty uh, Aphrodite. <laughs> have you, have you read this, uh, this letter from this young 14 uh, year old boy? No, I haven't. Oh, wow. Well, I'll email it to you because it's Ooh, just, please. it's, it's, it's everything, uh, you know, it's heartwarming to see, uh, uh, someone of that age who really is holding up the, the ideal of the Olympics. Not just the Olympics, just everyday living, you know, life and the way we should be conducting ourselves as humans on this planet. Exactly. All right. Let's let's just dive right in because time is uh, always of the essence. Leo Wanta, uh, it, tell me a little bit about uh, who he is and was. I'll tell you. Whenever someone asks me to explain who Lee or Leo Wanta is, it, it feels like I'm trying to get my arms around the wind, Richard. It's such a complicated story. Probably the hardest job I have tonight is trying to simplify it into understandable conversation within an hour time constraint. Um, he's one of the most interesting men in the world, uh, and his life experiences sound something like a good fiction writer would create, a little James Bondish, uh, if you will, and I'll take a cue from the Queen. But uh, let me say this about what I hope we talk about tonight. Lee is the man who by bringing down the Soviet Union ruble, and that's been proven beyond a doubt, caused the Iron Curtain and, and the Berlin Wall, uh, Checkpoint Charlie, to come tumbling down. Um, this is the guy who created the largest fortune ever amassed by one person. Um, he created $27.5 trillion and wanted to give $23 trillion of it to the American people to pay off the oh, irresponsible, there's no word for what it is, the debt uh, of today's Federal Reserve and a lot of corrupt politicians, frankly. The point is, when he, when he served as President Ronald Reagan's personal intelligence coordinator, um, he promised Reagan... He would bring down the Soviet Union ruble, which he did, and he would invest and save the profits from that endeavor to pay America out of debt when the overspending crooks in government put my nation into bankruptcy, and that, that time would be now. Mm. And, and give us a time frame. We're talking about the Reagan administration, so some, somewhere between 1980 and the fall of the Berlin Wall in uh, 1991, correct? Uh, the, the Berlin Wall fell in 91. Um, the Iron Curtain came down. The ruble went down, I believe, in 89, unless I'm... Now it would have been about the same time. But, <clears throat> yeah, in that time frame. And, and the reason it covers such a long time frame, Richard, is because uh, this all started with the presidential task force. Um Lee's story involves a lot of well-known people like Hillary Clinton and Vince Foster and George Herbert Walker Bush and his son George W. and William Clinton and Barack Obama, Dick Cheney, Dan Quayle, Vladimir Putin, George Soros, Al Gore. He was involved with all of them, and his story is filled with intrigue uh, that involves the Soviet Union, Stinger missiles, Osama bin Laden or Tim Osman, as Lee says he was known when bin Laden was a CIA agent. Um, and I need to say this, too. Ambassador Wanda has two first names. 
his birth certificate name is Lee. His uh, baptism certificate was Leo. And when he went to get his driver's license when he was 15 or 16, the, whoever it was at the driver, driver's bureau told him Leo was a more masculine name, and so that's what he put on his driver's license. And that was the name he used as a, a covert agent. All right. He does sound a little bit like James Vaughn. For those of you who have been following the Olympics and watched the opening ceremony and Daniel Craig, uh, our new James Bond, perhaps one of the best, uh, yeah. had a, a wonderful little comedy moment with uh, with Queen Elizabeth. Um, but uh, the, Leo Wanta, or Lee Wanta as the case may be, uh, sounds like a real-life James Bond. Uh, joining us on the line is Marilyn Magruder-Barnwall, and she's here to tell us about Leo Wanta and the missing $27.5 trillion. Uh, has been described as the biggest scandal uh, in the world, in history. Now, uh, how did he orchestrate the collapse of the Soviet Union's ruble? How was this done? In simple in t- terms that uh, uh, a layman uh, could understand, someone who yeah, didn't graduate from Harvard Business School. There's simple way to, to talk about it. Okay. Uh, through, uh, you've got to get there. What made it possible? Okay. And that takes us into the Presidential Task Force. All right. The task force began meeting in 1981. This wasn't something someone just went in and sort of heroically did in one minute. The planning on it started in 1981. And it didn't happen until 1990. So it was a lot of planning. The presidential task force uh, was made up originally of Bill Colby, who was um, CIA director in the 70s, I believe, uh, 76 through 79, something like that. Then Bill Casey, who was Reagan's um, CIA director, and Lee Wanta, Leo Wanta. <coughs> I also have to make clear that Lee never worked for any of the alphabet agencies. He never worked for the NSA or the CIA or any of that. He was covert. He worked by contract. He was never employed as an employee of any of those agencies. Um, But... How do we get into it? How did he generate the 27.5? Let's go into the preparation that came out of the task force. Right. Okay. Um, on March 23rd, I believe it was, Reagan gave a speech that about Star Wars. You remember Star Wars? Oh, yes, the Strategic That's Defense the Initiative. Yeah. Let's, let me uh, just uh, get you to hold on there. Uh, I want to get some business done here. And uh, on the other side, not that we're talking $27.5 trillion, but, you know, bills must be paid. On the other side, Marilyn Magruder-Barnwell will explain how Leo Wanta brought the Soviet Union to its knees and made the American public, 27.5 or about $23 trillion actually, to boot. Uh, where is that money now? And uh, why is it in limbo? Back with more of The Conspiracy Show. Don't you dare go away. The truth will set you free, free, free. But first, it will really tick you off. Welcome back to Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. Welcome back. Marilyn Magruder Barnwall is with us. We're talking about Leo Wanta and the missing $27.5 trillion. And uh, we'll have, um, uh, Marilyn has sent along to me uh, links to a number of uh, documents. If you'd like to follow up on this, because uh, an hour is certainly not nearly enough time, but it'll certainly pique your interest anyway, this this program. And you can, uh, as always, we encourage you to dig further and dig uh, independently. And uh, and and uh, you've got to take what you hear here and, and, and uh, decide for yourself uh, whether this is all... True, uh, but the documentation is, is there. We'll provide that to you uh, on the website, uh, richardserrett.com. Now, we were talking about the, the presidential task force, and the, the idea here was to, I guess, bring uh, the Soviet Union to its knees and uh, enter Leo Wanta with this scheme. Well, it wasn't a scheme. It was a presidential task force that was put together by President Reagan. And it was uh, after the initial meetings between William Colby, William Casey, and Leo Wanta, other intelligence agencies were brought into it. And then when President Reagan went, this was happening 
in between the time of the election and when he took office in January um, of that year. And in March, as I said, he gave a speech about SDI, Star Wars. Well, so what's important about that? Reagan knew, first, we, they had to find a way to destabilize the ruble to begin with. The Soviet economy was never terribly strong. But so what they did was they used Star Wars. They knew that they could, that if the Soviet Union would be drawn in to a, this race with the United States to develop Star Wars type technology, that it would to some degree destabilize an already weak economy. That was an important part of the plan. Then on December 4th of 1981, still the first year of his presidency, Reagan <clears throat> did a, a, another preparatory step. Um, he signed Executive Order 12333, which was key to this. It's known as Title 18, Section 6 of the United States Code. At this executive office, uh, EO, <laughs> I'm going through this so fast, uh, authorized U.S. intelligence services to create or establish corporations owned by the U.S. government for intelligence purposes. So, in other words, American spies could, because of this EO, covertly establish and, and operate at taxpayer expense these companies. And Leo Wanta uh, implemented numerous of those companies, but... 25 or 30 of them that I recall, but the one that was involved with the Russian ruble was New Republic, and it was located in Vienna, Austria. Um, he and members of his team began meeting with people representing nations that did business with Soviet bloc nations, like Iran and Iraq, for example. They sold oil to the Soviets. Um, nations that were part of the Soviet bloc or the, these numerous nations that traded with them were paid in rubles, and the ruble couldn't be used outside of the USSR. So it was a huge weakness that they had uh, identified during these task force meetings, I guess, to create the plan. Uh, the money had to be used inside the Soviet bloc. Well, there were a lot of people. You can verify this, by the way, by reading uh, a book published by Simon & Schuster in 1994 called Thieves' World uh, by Claire Sterling about uh, what was going on. And, and there were numerous nations, numerous people trying to get rubles out of the, out of the Soviet Union. But the plan that emerged from this task force focused on what I perceive as an end run, end run kind of, you know, like when a quarterback hands off and somebody runs in the backfield kind of thing. Sure, like a diversion. Yeah, okay. But what they did was they focused on the nations that were doing business with the Soviet Union that had very limited use of rubles. Okay. And this can also be verified, by the way, um, in January of 81, uh, the Russian government did a a criminal case number eighteen slash five nine two two dash nine one. This was their investigation into what happened to their own market. And according to this final report, um, the the newly formed Russian Federation was practically invaded by Western businessmen. And uh, Lee Wanta succeeded while the others failed because he got a signed agreement with the new federation. I've got a copy of that agreement. It's signed by uh, Gennady Filchin, the Russian deputy prime minister at the time. <clears throat> and uh, in October, God, I told you this is a hard thing to say in interesting language, but Wanta proposed a swap of... 5 billion U.S. dollars for 300 billion rubles, which would be 28 rubles to the dollar. Uh, that was half of the black market rate. And his offer increased over a period of five years where he would pay 50 billion U.S. dollars for 
300 billion rubles. Now, the third part, by the way, of Reagan's plan, he gave Leo Wanta was made trustor of $150 billion to accomplish the bringing down of the Soviet Union ruble, the SUR. Um, that money, by the way, was paid back by Wanta to the United States Treasury within six months of the time he got it. Um, anyway, he um, the thing that attracted the Russians to what Leo Wanta was offering, and it's documented by Russia's own commission of inquiry, he offered to spend the dollars to import Western goods for what he's often said to me, called them, called it an emergency situation. He said the Russian people literally had nothing when the Soviet Union fell, and and he requested an immediate line of credit from the Soviets of 140,000 rubles to invest in the new Russian economy. And he he told me he brought everything from Tampax to frozen chickens into Russia. Uh, he also said it was the right thing to do for the people. Uh, this was after the collapse. This is afterwards. Nothing. Right. This is after the collapse. Yeah. Okay. And, and this was, well, the collapse was caused by the, right. by the rubles going out of the, out of the country. He said that New Republic, his, comp- his uh, company in uh, Vienna, Austria, was just able to get boatloads of rubles from the USSR and on average, it costs them from 18 to 28 cents per ruble. And, and at the time, the um, ruble was valued by the Soviets at $1.20 per so, ruble. So again, what was so attractive to them? Why were they willing to, to part with the ruble at half the, uh, the black market price? Well, they were very much in the same circumstance, Richard, as the United States is right now. If you, had, if you were a pension manager and you had your pension funds in a dollar and someone came around and gave you an opportunity to put them in the Chinese yuan or the renminbi, you probably would take them up on it since our currency is depreciating like crazy while the yuan is strengthening. Okay, that's what attracted them. So even though it was half the, pre- the, half the, uh, the black market price, they saw the ruble going nowhere but down and the U.S. dollar going nowhere but up. That's right. So they gambled, and uh, thinking they're going to come up on the upside, obviously. Okay, so and that makes they sense. they obviously did. Right. Uh, I mean, basically, you can look at American pension funds today and say they're in the same kind of danger Sure. that the, that the Soviet pension funds. And, and Lee said that, that he got money from the KGB pension fund, the GRU pension funds. He got them from all kinds of people. They basically were put into Brinks trucks, taken to Holland, packaged, sent to the uh, bank in Singapore, uh, and they would go and he would go into uh, Singapore, uh, the development bank. That's what I couldn't think of. But they, I, one occasion, I know they sent $70 billion in Soviet Union rubles to the, the, this development bank of Singapore, and um, the Soviets argued about the dollar twenty a ruble, not knowing, of course, that he had gotten them for eighteen to twenty eight cents. And they ended up agreeing to pay only a dollar eight, and they thought they were getting a really good deal because they didn't want to pay the dollar twenty per mass. I mean, they were the ones who put the value on it. They wanted a deal, and uh, so that's how they did it. Well. Then they took that money and they went to the countries, and this was the key. They went to the countries who owed money to the Soviet Union in rubles, and they sold those rubles to those countries, like like uh, Greece, right? And said, "Here, I'll give you rubles for thirty-two cents on the dollar for you to pay your debt." To the Soviet Union. So they were making four cents per ruble. Oh, they were making far more than that. Well, they bought it at twenty-eight cents, and they're selling it for thirty-two. In that case, yeah, yeah, that. The other case, they were buying it for eighteen to twenty-eight cents and selling it to the Soviet government. 
for a dollar eight. Right, right, okay. Okay, so you've got two different situations. But the importance of the second one thing is when they, when these com- countries began paying their debt to the Soviets with rubles that they had purchased for 38 cents on the ruble, or 38 rubles on the dollar twenty value, it it totally depreciated the value of the ruble, and it fell. Ah, okay. Okay, right, and right. in the meantime, then, um, that was really the, the big blow. But when the currency hit bottom, <coughs> excuse me, we have high humidity and I have asthma, and I'm going to be clearing my throat. I apologize. There's Richard. a lot of that going around, especially with the yeah the humidity, the air conditioning. So you're among friends on that score. <laughs> but when when the the currency, when the Soviet ruble hit bottom, um, the the system, the whole Soviet system needed cash, and Leo Wanta went through New Republic and agreed to purchase 2,000 metric tons of gold from the USSR central bank using dollars created from the sale of the rubles that had cost him only 18 to 28 cents each. Right, right. So on average, a 78, 75% discount from, from the actual cost. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the money used to buy the 2,000 metric tons of Russian gold, and that belonged to Leo Wanta personally. Ah, okay. And so does the, the gold he bought with that money. And... and I want to go back to the breaking up of the $27.5 trillion. The total amount was 27.5. Of that amount, $4.5 trillion belongs to Lee Wanta personally. $23 trillion of that money belongs to the American people. In reality, the entire $27.5 belongs to Lee Wanta. But he is the one who insisted that $23 trillion of it go to the American people. His 4.5 is a commission contract that paid for all those years that he was doing life-threatening things for the United States government. I mean, he was the one who went over and got Stinger missiles back from uh, Osama bin Laden, who, by the way, his CIA name as an agent, is Tim Osman. Tim he Osman. the one who went and got those Stinger missiles left over from the Kuwaiti war. Listen, that uh, the Osama bin uh, Laden uh, angle is uh, uh, perhaps the subject of an entirely different show that you and I can do together. But let's just uh, hold on. Stay put, Marilyn. When we come back, we'll uh, delve further into the mystery man, Leo Wanta, and that missing $27.5 trillion. Don't go away. This is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. Follow Richard on Twitter at Richard Serrett. For show information, visit the website strangeplanet.ca. Leo Wanta and the missing $27.5 trillion. Listen, I'm no Ben Bernanke, uh, so let me just, let me try and summarize here in, uh, in layman's terms, uh, just to bring people up to speed if you're just joining us. So a presidential task force... Uh, in 1981, Ronald Reagan basically, uh, 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 Colby, the head of the CIA at the time, who um, mysteriously, I think, turned up face down in the Potomac River. Maybe, maybe that's connect. There's a connection there. Maybe not. We'll find out. Perhaps timing al- time allows, if time allows. Uh, but uh, so, so Leo Wanta is is charged with this uh, this um, task force to to go out and try and bring the Soviet Union to its knees. Uh, and then through a an, a series of sort of currency swaps, he depreciates, he manages to depreciate the Soviet ruble, while at the same time amassing a huge fortune, then uses uh, that money to buy from the Soviets, who are cash hungry now at this point, uh, was it 22,000 metric tons of gold? Right. Now, we're talking now uh, late 80s, early 90s. Now, gold was around, I think at the start of the 80s, was was closing in at around 900 an ounce. Now, by the end of the, the 80s, early 90s, it, it had, you know, it was around 400 an ounce. Right. So, so, and that it was the early 90s that, that he bought it. I believe it was 91. 
But the other thing he did with the money, and this is just a fast last thought on how did he get all this money, uh, he took the remaining cash and, and he bought prime bank guarantees, which when you're buying them with very massive amounts of money, he was able to get 7.5 uh, interest on 10-year plus one-day maturities. Wow. Um, and his company, New Republic, was buying them at like a 66, 68 percent discount par value per hundred million dollars. And, and they could either loan against them or sell them or transfer them at 88 to 92 percent, which meant they were making 20 million dollars par value per hundred million invested. And, and Richard, they were doing this over and over and over again. Every hour on the hour, Lee said. My word. Um, it and, generated a tremendous amount of money, and that is how Lee Wanta created the $27.5 trillion. One thing I want to correct, I, I, though I am a journalist, I started out that way, and that's what I went back to uh, in 1993 when I became disabled. My graduate degree is banking, and I was a banker, not a bank journalist. Um, I created the first private bank in the United States and consulted for that. And this is all, I hope that that communicates it well enough because I know we bankers tend to talk in terms that are hard. I think people grasp the sort of the, the, uh, the broad strokes, which is all we can hope for in an hour. Now, what did he do with all that gold, 22,000 metric tons? He uh, took it to Singapore and they melted it into 12.75 kilogram bars, 12.25, I can't remember. And it was uh, hidden in Kloten, K-L-O-T-E-N, Switzerland. And then he just waited for the, the the price of gold to go up, I guess, which it did invariably, inevitably. Well, um, I, it's hard to know what he would have done with the gold because on July 7th in 93, his world got turned upside down. And, and uh, I need to go back to when they decided he was going to be the leg man for this event, for all this that was going on. When that became evident, somebody who was involved in that presidential task force was leaking to someone else because Wanta was set up in Wisconsin on a bunch of absolutely nonsensical um, tax warrants that were issued against him that had nothing to do with him. And, Richard, I have every one of the court transcripts, and, I mean, it fills five large legal size books and i've read them and i've read them again and there is no way to come to any conclusion other than he was being set up in 1981 for whenever they wanted to take him down and and get their hands on the money because they could see what was going to happen and on july 7th 1993 the state of Wisconsin used these unlawful, they literally are unlawful, tax warrants that had nothing to do with Lee Wanta. They had to do with a company called Falls Vending Services, Inc., and filed against him as if he were responsible for that company's debts. That started in 82, and that went on, and I, I just read this, and I look at it and say, what in the world? And it took me going through it twice to figure out that he was being set up way back then. In other words, they wanted to to get all the the paperwork in order in the early 80s, but at the same time, let him go out and make that vast fortune. Uh, Then, uh, when that money had, that fortune had been amassed, then they bring out the, um, these false warrants, as you say, and in in, in order to, I'm presumably, I'm presuming to get that money away from him. That's right. That's exactly what happened. All right, we'll pick up on that point on the other side. Marilyn Barnwall is uh, with us as we continue to discuss Leo Wanta and the missing $27.5 trillion. Stay with us. I'm Richard Serrett. As you're staring up at the night sky, ever wonder who's staring back? You're listening to Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. Marilyn Barnwall is with us, the author of When the Swan's Neck Breaks, and we're talking about uh, Leo Wanta and the $27.5 trillion. So these trumped-up charges, um, uh, I guess from the, was it the Wisconsin Department of Revenue officially that laid the charges? 
uh, for what? Essentially a trumped-up charge of, of tax evasion or, or fraudulent concealment or something like that? Well, yeah, they basically were saying that he uh, evaded taxes, and uh, which was totally untrue, totally untrue. And, and that I've got the written evidence loud and clear on. They arrested him. He was paying a breakfast bill. He was meeting with Vince Foster that day at uh, the hotel. Oh, he was in Geneva. I can't remember the name of the hotel. Uh, Lee was staying with a bunch of other people at the Hotel Alac. Uh, he had uh, uh, all kinds of people there with him. And he had been appointed in April of 93 as ambassador to Switzerland and also to Canada by the nation of Somalia. And his That's a uh, strange ambassadorial chapter. investiture, by the way, was witnessed by the foreign minister of France under the Sarkozy administration, um, Alan Juppé, the Honorable Alan Juppé. Uh, I believe he was a former mayor of Bordeaux. In fact, I think he was the mayor of Bordeaux when that investiture occurred. That's kind of a strange assignment, uh, uh, ambassador for Somalia to Switzerland and Canada. I mean, uh, I, I, not that we have time, but uh, uh, <laughs> that's an interesting appointment, one would have to say. But um, we'll save that one for next time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but anyway, they, uh, you know, the, the fact is he told the Swiss that he was entitled to diplomatic immunity when they arrested him because he had been told, and again, I believe this was part of the setup, and this is me, not Lee, this is my opinion, that uh, the FBI or, or his his handler, I don't know what else you call them, um, in New Orleans told him to take with him all of his records. He his partner had died in um, Singapore. He didn't die. He was killed. Howie Kwong. Yeah, Howie Kwong was uh, Howie Kwong was murdered with rat poison. Right after, two weeks after a president of the United States, a former president, visited the bank that Howie and Leo Wanta owned in Singapore. And, uh. Looking for the, that money. Yeah. The result of that was that Vice President Dan Quayle got him out of Singapore into a safe house in Toronto. As a matter of fact. Interesting. Okay. Always looking for that Canadian connection, and there we have no, it. No, I've got that Canadian connection. <laughs> I'm in you. touch with them. I've verified. I can tell you I have verified almost everything we're saying. I mean, verified beyond a point of doubt. Some of the things, uh, when it involves secret mission stuff, I don't have access to all the documents, but I have access to some of Lee's field reports and things. I'm just trying to figure out who's wearing the, you know, the, the, the white hats and the black hats. Maybe nobody. Maybe they're all wearing gray hats. But when you say Dan Quayle uh, is is helping um, uh, Leo Wanta, I, I guess the, what I'm asking is, is well, who then is trying to get their hands on the money, and who's trying to protect this this trust for the American public? So it sounds like, are you saying Quayle and, and the Bushites are are trying are in, in Lee's corner? Well. Uh, Dan Quayle uh, was in his corner. I wouldn't say Bush was. Um, if you go, I, I, uh, if you go to the blogspot wtsnbblogspot.com, you will find a writ of mandamus there. And in that writ, here are the people that Lee listed uh, as being responsible for um, tying up the 4.5 trillion. And, that, and it'll give you an idea of who he believes was involved in all this. The Secretary of the Treasury, who at that time was Paulson, Henry Paulson. The Attorney General of the United States, Gonzalez. Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase. Citibank Citigroup. Goldman Sachs. The United States Department of, of the Treasury, um, including but not limited to Secretary Paulson. Deputy Secretary Kemet. Uh, and others, Secretary Chertoff, the Department of Homeland Security, mm -hmm. uh, some compliance officers, and the Federal Reserve Bank of, of uh, in this case, in the case of the lost funds, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank. But he, this happened, he gave Vince Foster $250 million that day before he was arrested. And the money was for Hillary Clinton for the Children's Defense and 
Vince Foster, of course, was killed in less than two weeks. I'm sorry, he committed suicide in Marcy Park with no weapon around him. He was um, suicided, in other words. <laughs> yeah. And that's that's connected to Leo Wanta? Yes. Well, I, to the degree of saying Leo had just given him uh, $250 million on the 7th of July, and I believe it was the 19th or 20th of July that uh, it was within two weeks right. that Foster was killed. And, and if you'll recall, there was a big to-do about... Uh, Hillary and Bill would not let the authorities go into Vince Foster's safe until they went into it first because for national security reasons, quote-unquote. Remember that? Yes, I do. In other words, add Hillary and Bill Clinton to the list of those that were trying to get their hands on uh, uh, Leo Wanta's $27.5 trillion. That's right. Okay. Just because we're short on time, I know we're, we're skipping over some things, uh, including um, Leo's arrest and uh, being brought back to uh, Wisconsin uh, in violation of the law, arrested in New York, and, and these sorts of things. But what what efforts was he was he making to get that twenty seven point five trillion, or, to, or we should say twenty three trillion, back into the U S. Treasury? Well, he was trying working on the entire twenty seven point five. He ended up agreeing to accept. 4.5, which was on contract in writing that they clearly owed him and, and so on. That money, the $4.5 trillion, was wire transferred by the Bank of China, People's Bank of China, which is their central bank, into the United States, into the Bank of America in Richmond, Virginia, um, in 2006. Lee got rid of some of his corporations, which he had been ordered, well, he had been told by Judge Gerald Bruce Lee, uh, the federal district court in uh, Ar- Arlington or Richmond, I'm not sure which, Virginia, um, to liquidate his assets and bring the money back into the country. And the 4.5T was the first exercise in that. That money was wire transferred by the People's Bank in 1996 and immediately disappeared down the rat hole. Ah. So, I mean, he, when he was ordered to do this, he was very willing to comply. He wanted to do this, perhaps. He, or did he see this as a fulfillment of his promise to the American public, or did he know? Absolutely. Okay. It was a, a promise he made. He and Ronald Reagan were friends, and it was a promise he had made to Ronald Reagan. So that four trillion plus dollars disappeared, disappeared. off the books, and um, so where is the other twenty three trillion? Do we know? Well, that's why they, when they brought him back from Switzerland. By the way, I have all the court transcripts from Switzerland too, and he they put him in prison, filed no charges against him whatsoever, kept him in prison four and a half months, one hundred and thirty four days in Lausanne, Switzerland, and, and this was done on the basis of a promise from a, a uh, revenue agent in Wisconsin named Dennis Ullman, who, you know, he was going to get all the information for this tax evasion charge. Well, it didn't come, and Yitzhak Rabin sent him a coded message because Leo had $10 billion to give to the Palestinian and and Jewish authorities on their peace process. And that's why Yitzhak Rabin was inquiring. And suddenly the Swiss got very cold feet. They put him on an airplane on November 17th at gunpoint and sent him back to New York. He was put in prison for two days in Brooklyn, federal prison, taken before Magistrate Aline Ross, Judge Ross, who immediately threw the entire case out. He walked out of that courthouse a free man, and in the meantime, Ullman had contacted the New York police who rearrested him, put him in jail again in Brooklyn on the promise that they were going to be, he was going to be extradited on some kind of charges from Wisconsin, and they didn't have the charges. He sat there for a month before Wisconsin got it put together. And I've just been doing a big investigative deal on that. And the cases that were filed to get that extradition, Richard, were those bogus cases, the tax warrants 
that had been issued back in the 1980s, the early 80s, and in which three judges had come out with firm decisions saying Lee Wanta was not responsible for any of that debt or tax debt. And while he's sitting in in a Kettle Moraine Correctional Facility in in Wisconsin or wherever, was he approached by anyone who said, "Listen, give us the the golden keys to this twenty three trillion, and you can walk away"? Was, did anyone make it known to him? That's what they. No, want? what they decided to do, <clears throat> they tried to get him committed for one thing, and a very brave chief mental health psychiatrist at um, Winnebago, Con, Dr. Connie Lee just said the only people who are crazy here are the people in Madison who are filing these charges. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this man. Can and, I ask you, where, mm-hmm. where is Leo today? Is he is he out of prison, in prison, in oh, hiding? he's out of prison. He got out of prison in mm, 2001, just uh, before or just after, I can't remember the exact date right now, um, of 9-11. And I have been to Oklahoma twice. I've talked with his case manager while he was in prison there. If you look at his Department of Prison Records, it shows the entire time he was in prison in Oklahoma, which was from uh, 98 until 2001, his records indicate he was in New Orleans in prison. And and, uh, why doesn't he go public and say to the American public directly, listen, I have $23 trillion. I could wipe out uh, the deficit. I don't know what the the federal, the the debt uh, is now. It's... uh, about sixteen trillion. So he could wipe out the the the, the debt. That's absolutely right. In one and fell he swoop. has gone public. Have you tried to get anything published in in the media in the <laughs> United States of America, Richard? Yeah, fair enough. Yes. Can't exactly. do it. That's why I'm here talking to you. Exactly. That's why I write about it in my articles. Try to get. It's not the safest thing in the world to write about, because this all involves Soros. It involves all kinds of people. So. He wants to give it back. He can't because he knows if he if he wrote a check to the U.S. Treasury, it would just it would it would uh, it would be gobbled up by the, the what the Federal Reserve uh, and its member banks. Uh. Well, bear in mind, while he the reason they put him in prison, and then they put him on a school bus in the middle of the night from Kettle Moraine, where four attempts were made on his life. By the way, when they figured out they couldn't get him into a mental hospital, which would have given them access then to the money, and they sent him to Oklahoma. They went around to the banks around the world where they were able to identify the accounts by using Promise Software, which was a, if you want to get a really good story, look up P-R-O-M-I-S Software put out by the Enslaw Company. That tracks all of the money that goes around uh, the world. And, And they went to those banks and told them Leo Wanta was dead. And that's how they got their mon- their hands on a lot of the twenty three trillion. A lot of it is gone. Okay. Yeah. Oh dear. All well, right. it's not so much gone as it is they're using it. How do you think they manipulate these markets, the gold market, the silver market? My word. Listen, um, Marilyn, we will do a part two. Uh, we'll uh, we'll be in touch. I thank you for this, and I, I I know that we've piqued a lot of interest out there. And I will uh, uh, post links to all of those uh, important uh, documents that you've passed on to me, so people can follow up on their own. In the meantime, thank you. We'll speak soon. Good. God bless. Marilyn Barnwell, Leo Wanta, and the missing twenty seven point five trillion. And you can learn much more at the website www.richardserrett.com. Richard Sarrett's Strange Planet drops every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Subscribe at strangeplanetpodcast.com.